back on the Young Turks with our power panel. Today joining us, Tina Dupuy, managing editor of Crooks and Liars and syndicated newspaper paper columnist. And then Zed, uh, Zed Jelani is uh, in Washington, D.C. He's a senior reporter blogger for Think Progress, who's been, uh, been doing some great work lately. And uh, Zach Carter is in Washington as well. He's helping the post senior political economy reporter. All right, guys, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I want to uh, do the first topic here. Will Newt back off? Now, he's been getting a ton of pressure. Sununu's out there threatening everybody, saying, ah, oh, you work with Newt. I don't know. You could have trouble on your hands. I don't know if you're ever going to get a job again. Or if you'll get financing, Adelson, who's his main backer. Rush Limbaugh is comparing Rick Perry, who's doing similar attacks to Fidel Castro. So is Newt going to back off? Tina, you start. I hope not. This is like watching a suicide bomber going after something that you really want to see hit. Um, you know, he's blowing everything up. Uh, he's going after uh, Romney for being a capitalist, which is hilarious. Uh, you know, he, he, right after he left the speakership, he went straight into a, a Bain Capital competitor, uh, uh, Fort Smith uh, Little. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he, this guy is like everything that he is guilty of. He likes to go after other people. And now the Republican Party has strangely had to stand up against capitalism. It's fantastic. I hope he I hope he goes all the way. Now, it's said this is really interesting because he, he right now he doesn't seem to be backing down. He said, right. uh, for example, don't talk about who got all the money. Can't we just move forward letting the uh, rich keep all the money. He's saying that's what, you know, Mitt Romney is saying, who is a Republican. He's saying, no, 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 we got to say, hey, where do the rich get the money from, et cetera. I mean, he almost sounds like a progressive. Is he really going to go down this road or is somebody going to come to him at some point and go, hey, Newt, you remember those great speaking fees you were getting and all that money you were getting for being a historian? Look, that stuff's going to go away if you're not a good guy. Well, I, th I think he's already backed off some of his criticism. I mean, he was already saying, you know, I don't, I'm not going after capitalism. I'm not anti-capitalist. But I think really the wider point here is that the Republican Party, the establishment, doesn't feel the same way that everyday Americans do about big finance. You know, most Americans think that big finance is not that useful to the country. I mean, Mitt Romney was not a brilliant doctor or a brilliant engineer. He raided companies, made gigantic profits, loaded them up with debt and laid off tens and tens of thousands of people. That's really horrible behavior. That's not the sort of social democratic capitalism that we love. That's sort of a vulture capitalism and big finance capitalism. Um, one of Rick Perry's financiers, a big finance guy in South Carolina, actually switched, uh, it switched who he endorsed. He actually endorsed Mitt Romney because he hated so much that Rick Perry was actually talking like an everyday American. And, um, you know, there was a guy from the American Enterprise Institute that wrote that it's actually great what Mitt Romney's doing at Bay, what he did at Bay. And he actually said that he wants him to run the USA the same way. The, the, he actually called it, I think, the failing corporation of the USA. But we, you know, everyday Americans, people who didn't grow up you know, privileged and didn't get uh, basically handouts their entire life and raided companies and looted them, everyday Americans know that's not true. I mean, if America was a big corporation, then we'd all get laid off and they'd go and hire Indonesian citizens for $2 an hour. <laughs> and they probably wouldn't give them citizenship either. So, Zach, it seems that Republican politicians are stuck in a rock and a hard place, right? On the one hand, they've got these huge financiers who say, hey, listen, the whole point of the, the party is to serve me. So what are you doing? Get back in line, okay, and shut your mouth. On the other hand, you saw the stat that we uh, showed in the beginning of the show. Even 55% of Republicans say that they have strong or very strong feelings that the, that the rich and the poor are in conflict, right? So if you want to get the voters, you got to actually appeal to that. But if you want to get the money, you got to appeal to your uh, money guys. How do they resolve that? I, I think, uh, just as you said, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, one of the things about Bain Capital, the private equity is, is sort of a pure distillation uh, of, of corporate American capitalism in, in which uh, profits come first and, you know, sort of women and children come last. And so, sometimes that works out well and sometimes it, it doesn't. Uh, and I think it's really, really troubling for all of the Republican candidates right now and also to some extent for Barack Obama. That, that nobody has really articulated a vision for, for what you do for everybody who sort of gets left behind. Mitt Romney likes to talk about creative destruction a lot. He's, he's always talking about, well, you know, if, if I wanted to create a lot of jobs, I could just, you know, ban tractors, then we need a whole lot more farm labor, things like that. Uh, well, well when, when you have these sort of creative processes, which oftentimes are actually, you know, good things, some people get left behind. And Mitt Romney has not said anything about what should be done about those people. And for, for Newt Gingrich, 
you know, one of the things he keeps talking about on the campaign trail is welfare reform that he did in the 90s with, with Bill Clinton. Well, welfare reform has been a total disaster. It just fundamentally has not worked during a recession. We have more poverty today than we did in 1996, uh, and yet we have much, much less actual aid going out to people than we did in 1996. So someone at some point has got to point out that there's a difference between being a capitalist and a, and a private equity entrepreneur uh, and, and actually running a country and, and trying, trying, to, trying to, uh, to manage a functional society. Right, and, and look, it, I don't know how Romney thinks he's going to appeal to people uh, based on creating jobs when he's never created any jobs. He, you know, overall, did he create jobs at Bain? It's a, totally up to, you know, it's a good question, but nobody's really resolved the question. And in fact, he cut a lot of jobs. That's why we're in this situation. When he was the governor of Massachusetts, uh, he was number 47 out of 50 states in job creation. This guy's a loser. He doesn't know how to create but, jobs. But can I just point out, I mean, you're talking about facts, but we're talking about Republicans. <laughs> oh, good. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I know it's true. Like, for example, his big populist thing for Mitt Romney now is, I will index minimum wage to, uh, so that it goes up with inflation. He made the same exact promise in 2002, and then they gave him, they said, all right, great. Uh, increase the minimum wage dollar twenty five. Here's the bill. He vetoed it. Yeah. He's a liar. All right. You get my drift on Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich. So we're going to move on to the second topic here. Do we have too much trust in our commanders? So it's interesting because the Republicans always say, uh, what am I going to do? I, I, I don't have a mind. I, I'm not a leader. I'm just going to ask the commanders, oh, commander, commander, what do I do? Well, it turns out a guy who's against that is General Martin Dempsey. He's only the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, right? Uh, so the top you know, uh, general that we have in the country. He said, quote, I find some of those articles about divergence and control of the generals to be kind of offensive to me, saying that we should need to have civilian control. It's very important, the idea that the commander should decide what the, uh, which direction to go in with foreign policy, he finds offensive. He also says, it will be our civilian leaders who make that decision, and I don't find that in any way to be a challenge to my manhood. Okay, I love that. So, uh, Tina, you know, it's in the rest of the press, bow down to the commanders. Is that the wrong way to go? Well, interesting enough, the only candidate who's ever brought this up, you know, in the like 300 debates that we've had so far, is John Huntsman. And he pointed out that if we would have listened to the commanders on the ground during Vietnam, we'd still be in Vietnam. And it was like one of those moments where you're like, did he really say that? Uh, but it's true. And people like Pat Buchanan still will, you know, uh, opine that we lost the Vietnam War because we left too soon. Right. Uh, no, it's a great point. At National Security Network just put something out on this. They said if we had listened to the commanders uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right. a we lot of us would exactly. be dead right now. We would not okay. be here. You got Thank it. God Kennedy didn't listen right. to those commanders. Uh, Zed, do we have to get beyond this nonsense of deferring to the commanders? And are they really using it as an excuse to, for more and more war? No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. You know, Ron Paul and John Huntsman both made this point that we have civilian control of the military. The only military person in recent times that we've had uh, lead the country with General Dwight Eisenhower, and he was very, very, uh, you know, very, very strong proponent of that. I mean, I do think we should listen to commanders in terms of military strategy. You know, if they say this is the way we defeat the enemy, of course we need to take that into account. But the actual mission, the actual goal of our foreign policy is under civilian control, and the civilians are accountable to us. I mean, we're not a democratic country if we're letting unelected people tell us, you know, should we stay in Afghanistan until 2013, until 2014. And I, I'm, you know, I'm really, really disappointed in people on the right and people, you know, the Republican and the Democratic parties who constantly use the military as human shields to say, well, the commanders need this time to fight. You know, I, I think what the commanders need is civilians who know when we should go to war and when we shouldn't and should be able to listen to the people who want to get out of Afghanistan, who don't want a war with Iran, you know, and so on and so forth. We're not supposed to be a military state. We're supposed to be a democracy. Our commanders don't control us. We control them. Now, Zach, uh, one other thing here. I, I also blame the media because they're the ones that have built this cult of the commander, right? And if you say, if you have this conversation almost on any other network, their heads will explode. They'll, oh my God, you challenged the commanders! You have challenged the gods. So am I on to something there? Is the problem that we got to break through this on the media? Well, we, we have sort of a, a, a giant, uh, well, I mean, the military industrial complex is nothing new, but, but sort of the, the, uh, the military pundit complex is something that's gotten much, much broader in, in the last decade or so. There was a study done a couple of years ago about people leaving the military, going on to become military analysts while being funded by defense contractors and various interests that were, had, a, had a very significant financial interest in continuing war. And 
that, that's troubling. I mean, I, I think the revolving door between the, the military and, and sort of the, the defense contractor class is maybe not as bad as it is in, say, finance and, uh, and the regulatory agencies. You know, we had the, the top bank regulator for years, John Dugan, was a former bank lobbyist. Think, things like that aren't, aren't quite as as extreme, but one thing we learn from the, the financial regulatory experience is that there's this culture that gets adopted among among the, the people who are at the top on both sides of both the private and public sector, in which the the sort of private sector profiteers end up end up very greatly influencing the worldviews of the people inside the public sector performance. And in a lot of ways, uh, it, it's not an explicit you know quid pro quo act of corruption, but people come to see the world as okay. Uh, I, I'm here, and my, my job here is to do things that uh, that make money for for other people on the other side of this fence. Yeah, the military has a, has a very strong culture. That it's, it's not it's not quite as bad as it is in finance, right. but uh, that that is a problem that does exist. Now that's a great point by Zach, and everybody knows. Hey, listen, if you're against the wars, you might not get that contract from those defense contractors when you retire. You're pro wars. You're pro Abrams tank. You're pro F-22, pro F-35. Believe me, you're getting a big fat job afterwards. We got to draw a line here. By the way, here's my proposal if you're a general uh, you cannot join a defense contractor for at least 10 years after you retire they'll say but how do I get rich well I don't care how you get rich I want you to protect the country I don't want you to worry about how you're gonna get rich all right call me crazy all right Tina Zed and Zach you guys are great thank you so much uh, now when we return you're not gonna believe who they're calling terrorists now it is so outrageous Anna will tell us when we come back